Good to go. Hey. Well, I want to start first by thanking everybody for being here. I am certain I speak on behalf of the Port Commission and Port staff. We recognize that everybody's time is valuable and limited and investing time in your port is very, very much appreciated. We're very excited about this project and are eager for a continued dialogue with you. The first meeting that we had about a month ago, that was the first public meeting was focused on setting a broad table and inviting the creative process to flow. Essentially, there are no, no, no bounds, let's just get it all on the table and brainstorm and dream together. It was a fun, um, a fun meeting, I really enjoyed it. This meeting today is going to put some bounds um, as a public entity, we are governed by uh, laws, rules, port policy, financial measures, etc. So the focus of today is going to shift a bit from the let's dream together to the let's see how what what is necessary to do work with the port so that we can start to refine some of that thinking from the first meeting into really tangible concepts moving forward. There are several presenters in tonight's meeting, so thanks in advance if there are any uh, technical hiccups, I hope there won't be, um, but in, in just in case. So with that, I'm going to pass the mic to Amos, who is with TAS in Olympia, and they are the consultants that have been working with the port on this curb funded project. So with that, Amos, I'll pass you the mic. Great. Thank you, Rachel. So yeah, our office, Humps Architecture Studios, hired by the port to help with this waterfront destination development plan. Um, like Rachel said, we've already gone through outreach number one. So this is a continuation. Um, so moving forward, just a big picture overview of who we are and the um, organization chart. So we have at the top, the Port of Olympia commissioners and below that uh, executive director, Sam Gibney. So she would report to the commissioners and then Rachel, who was just speaking as the project manager for this. Um, and then there we are in the middle, Thomas Architecture Studios. So we report to Rachel and just kind of this line up command all the way up to the commissioners. And then we are also managing a few different groups of people. So the general public, the advisory group, which we have established and we get regular feedback from them and some select stakeholders who are also soliciting some feedback from them as well. And then we also have a consultant team that's helping us makers, John Owen, um, site works for landscape, John Payne, we have SCJ, a local firm here, Bob Connolly, and also Mott McDonald for any port and coastal engineering that uh, we could use their assistance on. So here we have our project schedule. Um, you can see the big yellow arrow here. We're kind of right in the middle of December in the midst of our public outreach. So public outreach meeting number two here. We started with this information gathering stage, then the plan was to go into the uh, development of the plan, refine that development to a 90%, and then uh, do a final um, deliverable presentation that would happen out in February. We're still on track for the final presentation, but the process has um, changed slightly that we heard more from the public that uh, we want more opportunity for outreach. So we're extending that outreach uh, window more. We're gathering more information. We want to make sure we hear what it is that the public wants from this destination development plan. Uh, then we'll have an opportunity to feed that back in, in the following month into a final report of what we've heard and share that with the commissioners. You can see on the right some of the events that have already happened in light gray. We um, had additional stakeholder meetings. Um, we had some on the 12th and through feedback from some commissioners, we got um, some recommendations for additional stakeholders that we folded in. And then we're here December 16th for our uh, second outreach meeting and we have one more on January 20th. And, hey, Ms. I'm going to just chime in quickly in sure. to the select stakeholder meetings that are identified here because um, I see some of them on the phone that I haven't had a chance to connect with. We're scheduled to talk. Um, there are still we're still in the process of getting uh, stakeholder feedback. So ongoing. Yep. And then our final presentation, like I said, in February, that's February 8th. So we have this slide up to kind of refamiliarize the public with the process that we do want to hear what you have and make sure that you are involved. And right now we're in that kind of in between involves or collaborate stage. So basically working directly with the public, 
to hear what your concerns and make sure we understand what you're saying, as well as partner with you um, to include your decisions in our development plan. So we have received some feedback, community feedback and summary from our advisory group members, as well as our public outreach meeting number one. You see here, we assemble that in a chart. This is just a snapshot of all the comments that we have received. Um, we also, like I say, we have the select stakeholders feedback, which we're still assembling. So once we get that data all compiled and summarized, we'll be able to share that. And then the uh, same thing with the survey. Some of you have had a chance to actually um, sign on and fill out the survey. So that is actually closing out this evening, tonight at 10 o'clock. So once we get that closed out, we'll gather that information and provide a summary of that as well and share that with the public. Here is kind of a word cloud of what we heard from the first public outreach meeting. Uh, so all the chat comments as well as additional um, comments um, people spoke about. So you can see the larger words were the more prominent. So some of the things like sailing center, uh, marine time, space, water, then you get down to boats, living shorelines. So this is kind of a nice pretty picture of what it is that we heard from the public. Again, we're gonna continue to summarize this and provide a more um, kind of refined report of, of what it is that, that we're hearing from the public and share that with, with the port. Amos, can you please share before we move on to the next section, how many um, responses we have received to date? I have not checked recently, but on the last time I looked at the survey, it was 200, 300 and 347, I believe, 347 responses on the survey. So it's a pretty substantial number right. of, of people interested in this project and a lot of data for us to, to sort through. Yes. Uh, so okay. stepping forward, as Rachel was saying, kind of regulatory obligations and investigations. So I'm going to turn it back over to Rachel um, and then at another point, we're actually going to um, bring in Tadeo from um, Phillips Burgess. He's going to share a little bit more, but for now, um, Rachel, go ahead and take over. Yeah, next slide, please. So in what I want to do tonight is frame how we want to think about what can occur on port property. And there are several levels of regulation, oversight, and authority. Um, to just remind everybody, the um, we will be posting, Deb, the, the PowerPoint online. The mission of the Port of Olympia is to create economic opportunities by connecting Thurston County to the world by air, land, and sea. The Port of Olympia Commission, all of whom are on tonight's call, set goals, uh, overarching goals that they really want to see uh, underlie all of the decisions that they ultimately have responsibility to make. So I'm going to read through those because I think it's worth uh, spending a bit of time on understanding the Commission's goals themselves. The first is to strengthen our commitment to serve all of Thurston County, be a leader in environmental stewardship, promote and prioritize economic development throughout Thurston County, optimize and sustain the resources, finances, personnel, time, infrastructure, equipment necessary for the port to thrive and innovate and grow our value as a public port. The triangle on the right is a nice visual that outlines essentially how decisions are made at, at the Port of Olympia. At the very top, you have the commission and they set mi mission, vision, values, and focus areas for the organization. So ultimately it is the port commission that is driving this ship and ultimately authorizing work that's done at the port. They're also responsible for budgeting, setting priorities, approving, approving the budget in collaboration with the executive director then there are the business unit leads and the port staff who are essentially implementing, um, creating annual work plans, et cetera. So ultimately what, what emerges as the plan from this process will always undergo um, several uh, levels of assessment, ultimately landing in front of the commission for their approval. Um, they ultimately are the ones, as I've said, that will determine which projects move forward and how they move forward and the direction that they wanna see this plan take in the future. Next slide, please. So 
So through 20, in 2017, the Port of Olympia underwent a very thorough um, strategic planning effort. And I will give kudos to Mike Reed, who is now with the city of Olympia, who did an exceptional job of stewarding this process. Um, ultimately, the, the strategic plan that emerged is one aligned with essentially a triple bottom line, that the primary goals are to create economic opportunities, act as an environmental steward, create and maintain community assets. And it's the belief of the commission who ultimately adopted this strategic plan that when all three of those legs of the stool come together, what you get in the center is a resilient community. Outside of that, that circle, the triple bottom line essentially are the underlying values that uh, we want to thread through all of, of the work that we do. So to be accountable, sustainable, innovative, balanced, and engaged. And I think you know this process thus far uh, hits all of those marks nicely. Um, but ultimately these are this is the internal framework at the Port of Olympia, both the structure and how decisions are made, and also the strategic plan that is underlying the directions that we'll be moving into the future. So with that, I'm going to pass it to Tado from uh, Philip Spurgis, who's going to talk about some of the legal bounds that the that ports in general are, are obligated to stay within. So as we think about what, what can become of this area, we are also mindful of the uh, legal restrictions, opportunities, and parameters within which we need to operate. So with that, I'm going to pass the mic. All right, thank you so much, Rachel. Um, again, for everyone who didn't catch that, my name is Tadeo Veloso. I am an attorney at Phillips Burgess. And like Rachel said, I'm gonna be speaking briefly about uh, the powers and limitations imposed on the port and port districts generally um, concerning its use of real property from the state constitution, our statutes and some case law. Um, generally, the, our state constitution establishes a general policy that taxes and other public funds can only be spent for public purposes. And unless otherwise authorized by the constitution, a public purpose cannot be uh, accomplished by gifts or loans of public funds to private persons or organizations, um, except in those instances where it's going to the assistance of or or the um, and the definition or sort of the idea of public purpose was expanded around 1965 with Amendment 45 to our state constitution, which amended Article 8, Section 8 of the constitution. And this added a provision which empowers the legislature to authorize uses of port district funds for industrial development, trade promotion, and promotional hosting as a public purpose. And use of port funds for these purposes shall not be deemed a gift. So um, since the passage of Amendment 45 and since it was ratified into our constitution, there have been several uh, statutes that again, impose different uh, powers and limitations on what the port can do with its property. Um, so for example, RCW 5308020 authorizes port districts to construct, condemn, purchase, acquire, add, maintain, conduct, and operate improvements relating to industrial and manufacturing activities within the district. Um, if you don't mind going to the next slide. Um, RCW 5308040 authorizes a port district to improve its land by dredging, filling, bulkheading, providing water rays, or otherwise developing such lands for industrial and commercial purposes. And uh, this particular statute was revised um, within the near recent past. And um, with this revision, the current version of the statute likely applies to improvements um, which relate to the port district's usual purposes. So that includes handling, storing, processing, and preparing commodities for shipment. Um, RCW 5308080 authorizes a, district, a port district to lease real and personal property owned and controlled um, 
for purposes and upon terms uh, approved by the Port Commission. Um, I will also just some other ones which you can see here. Um, RCW 53-36-120 requires the, any expenditures for industrial development be made pursuant to specific budget items as approved by the Port Commission. So again, uh, those last two ones sort of go to the point that Rachel uh, talked about earlier that a lot of this stuff has to go through the Port Commission uh, before approval and before we move on to next steps. And um, without getting too into the weeds of the case law, because it's really developed through time, I will just say that as a result of the most recent case law in terms of these statutes and these statutory provisions, um, it appears that authorizing industrial, these provisions that authorize industrial development by port districts um, provide sufficient authority for those port districts to acquire land and for industrial development uh, to construct improvements relating to industrial and manufacturing activities um, and to improve their lands in a manner for lease to private industry. Um, that's all I'll say on that um, in terms of the statutory framework that the port is operating within right here. Um, and I will answer any questions that come up later, but um, I will leave that for now. And I'll send Thank it back you, to Rachel. Tadeo. And that, Tadeo did a great job of, of setting the framework for the state level. And then of course, when you get down to the project level, we move into regulation that is imposed by our uh, city and jurisdictions here. So with that, Amos will go through some of, some of that context. Great. Thank you. And then just to add, there was a, a lot of information there as well as the rest of the slide. So um, in the chat, someone asked a comment, but this, this PowerPoint will be made available, um, posted to the port's website tomorrow morning. So um, you'll be able to review any of this at, um, at your leisure tomorrow morning. So city, they also have their own regulations and requirements of what can and can't be um, done on the property and what the um, limitations are for some of these areas. Um, and one of those is zoning. So we are in an urban waterfront zone, as you can see in the orange there on the right, all along the east side of, of uh, East Bay, of, sorry, of the peninsula. So some of the permitted uses, um, eating and drinking establishments, restaurants, light industry, piers, um, office, art gallery, boat clubs, uh, health and recreation, so like a fitness center, marine museum, parks, playgrounds, uh, apartments, that's another thing that, uh, so you can have some residential mixed use in that area as well. Retail, some bed and breakfast, childcare, um, storage, public facilities, so anything related to that, and then conference center, commercial parking, uh, I think a hotel was in there as well. Yeah, hotel. So a lot of variety of uses, that's all permitted. There is some use, um, some other regulations, but in general, that's kind of the, the high level view of, of what is permitted to be developed in this area. Other regulations that we have to deal with is the um, height requirements. So in the urban waterfront zone, this is related to the uh, shoreline master plan, um, as well as the municipal code. So depending on where we're at, you can see the blue, green, and yellow, we're allowed to build up to 40 feet, 45, or 65 feet, just depending on those colors again. And when a Going into construction, depending on what you're doing, that kind of sets limits on um, how many floors you could have. So potentially like a three-story building, um, ideally at 45 feet, you might be able to squeeze another floor in there, but kind of limited to that. The shoreline master plan has additional setback requirements uh, based off of the shoreline itself. Uh, when, I, when you see the, the line required setbacks, that is from the property line and that's based off of like a street front to the property line. So there are no setbacks so that we could build right up to the, the edge of that property. Not to say that we would, it's just a, an option that's allowed through the city code. And then allowable coverage. So the individual um, lots, you're allowed to cover up to 60% and that's between shoreline and street. So anywhere from the water's edge to the nearest street, Marine Drive, 
you're allowed to cover up to 60%. Anything past that on the other side, which I don't think actually applies to this particular um, scope, would be 100%. So 100% of that site could be covered. Here, a little bit more about the Shoreline Master Program. So they have their own separate requirements uh, with a maximum height of 40 feet. So you saw in the earlier slide, it was 45 um, here, 40 feet. So we have to work through um, all codes and all regulations to make sure we hit those requirements. And then even lower when you're within 75 feet of the ordinary high water mark, OHWM. So anywhere from the ordinary high water mark back to um, 75 feet from that, you can't go over 25 feet. There's some additional setbacks for the shoreline of 100 feet, as well as a 50 foot vegetation conservation area. So a lot of requirements and regulations related to the shoreline master program that we have to, to meet. And then one other component that you definitely need to consider when looking at what type of um, development we want to see happen here is parking. So the city has certain requirements for um, maximum amount of parking or minimum, depending on how you look at it. So looking at residential parking, you need 1.5 stalls per unit. So the square foot or the footprint of the building has to be uh, reduced, if you will, in that site to allow for parking for these, uh, these options. One thing that um, is kind of unique for residential is there is an exemption for downtown area that um, parking is not required. So that, that um, could play to a favor depending on some of that development. Other things like retail have a 3.5 stalls per 10,000, sorry, that's a type of 1,000 square feet. No, that's, that's right, 1,000 square feet. And then uh, light industrial, one stall per every two employees, restaurants and bars, 10 stalls per 1,000 square feet. So again, that starts to add up pretty quick depending on what type of use you have. We just need to make sure we accommodate that in our development. Uh, so that kind of covers regulation, regulatory obligations. Uh, now I'd like to step into the finance and feasibility aspect of that. And I'm going to transfer, uh, pass the mic over to Alan from the port. Alan, are you available? Yep, I'm here. Perfect. So I'm Alan Rowe. I'm the business development and real estate director uh, for the port. And one of the things we look at down here, um, port wide, but also on the peninsula planning effort, is really looking at, you know, the port is approaching its 100th year. Uh, we're, we're hoping to go another 100 years. And, you know, with that is, is we only have a fixed amount of, of real estate and um, as it sits right now, and this is um, needed for long-term financial sustainability of the port. Um, the real estate um, is one of the, the large revenue generators uh, for the port. And so it serves as that source for earned income, um, along with then, you know, leveraging the development of that for economic development purposes and public benefit. Um, one of the ways we go about, um, you know, addressing what sort of uh, rates that we have uh, for our properties and, and the various options we have for our properties is um, we take a look and we've got the option of ground leasing um, our properties. We've got the option of, of selling. The port historically um, rarely sells any of its properties um, just because, again, we, we were looking for that long-term financial sustainability and having those properties in our, in our portfolio. And then um, also the, the public requirements, you know, based off of that situation of not being allowed to gift um, public funds. And, and that could be through the use of essentially um, not charging fair market value for our properties. Uh, the primary way we go about determining what we're going to lease uh, our properties for is we have our properties appraised and then we apply um, what in the industry is called a capitalization rate. Um, those rates vary, but uh, what it is is in, in a nutshell, it's your, it's your return that you're getting on the property. So uh, generally market is about 8%. And for example, if, if we were to have a property appraised and let's say it came back at $100,000 for the piece of property, uh, we would apply an 8% capitalization rate to that, um, which would be $8,000 per year then as uh, what we would charge for land uh, lease. When we move forward on development projects and especially um, down on our limited properties with the peninsula, understanding that that's 
all that we have. Um, we're starting to weigh, you know, rent uh, potential income versus um, operational income, and and how that's broken out is really into should we just ground lease um, this property, or should there be a port operation developed on the property that would also generate operational income on the site? Uh, next slide, please. Uh, two of those areas specific to um, this peninsula planning project is um, the potential of uh, looking at an RV uh, resort on our properties. And going through that as we, as we work on evaluating um, the feasibility and moving forward on that project and, and going through public process is, is really determining of that point I just mentioned before was, okay, what could we lease this property for um, to say a potential developer to be developed on and we would just ground lease um, the property and, and walk away from it. Just inspect what we're done from the ground lease uh, versus what if we were to develop an operation on that and, and generate income from it. Uh, for the RV based off of some market uh, studies that we have professionally done, uh, it does show basically the port could generate about 33% additional income um, beyond what we would get if we were just ground lease the property. And that is net income after all expenses are considered. That said, there is some risk versus reward. Um, if I was to ground lease the property, we just simply um, ground lease it. There's, there's very little risk. Um, we get our annual or monthly lease payments. And you know, if if someone was to unfortunately default on a ground lease, um, the improvements of that um, comes back to the port, and the port still has the property. Obviously, if the port was to invest into an operation, and the operation does not perform well, the port has invested a significant amount of funds, and potentially could could have a loss. Um, this particular case, what we've determined based again off of those market studies is um, the port would see a return on its investment within five years. And um, if potentially a better idea was to come along in the future um, that would generate the port um, additional funds and be a, a better public benefit, uh, we can potentially redevelop the site uh, since an RV uh, resort infrastructure is, is fairly minimal in the big picture. Uh, the other idea that has been open for consideration has been a hotel um, on the North Point site uh, of the peninsula. Uh, again, we're looking at, you know, does that make sense and what level of involvement uh, should potentially the port play a role in? Uh, we did have some market studies done for this one, uh, two specifically, uh, just because this is a much larger project. Um, those came back at potentially a net operating income of two and a half million dollars per year. Um, and that would be significantly more than a, a ground lease. Now, that figure does not include capital costs just because those vary. So um, after you consider what your actual debt service would be on a facility, you know, that net number is going to be re reduced. Um, the question is, is what, what sort of cost does that facility, you know, what, what cost is that facility? Again, it comes with risk. And then lastly, you know, at what level of ownership, you know, does does a, a port play a role? You know, the, the port would never operate a hotel, but there is opportunity for a port to own um, other municipalities, do own um, hotel properties. Those are primarily related to um, convention centers or airports. You know, in this case, we're looking at them. We have heard from the public um, a desire to have a, a more upscale hotel in the Olympia area, along with some other amenities and seeing that there hasn't been private investment um, to do that is the port then appropriate to step in and be involved with that, along with in the recent market, um, you know, with COVID, pretty much all financing has been locked down to any private entities to be able to do anything in the hospitality world. Um, and I believe that's it for my section. Great, thank you, Alan. So next steps, uh, this is where we wanna get some feedback from you, the public, you know, what you have to say, 
we can go back to some of these slides if you want us to uh, filter back to a particular slide. There are a lot of uh, several questions in the chat window I see, so we'll actually go through and address those as well. And I'm going to just pause for a moment to, to take care for uh, Open Public Meetings Act. And we do have a quorum on the call right now of port commissioners. So I'm going to ask the port commissioners, please write your questions down. Um, so that we can discuss this in a noticed public meeting, um, if you would be so kind. And we'll focus on public input tonight, just so that we're not at risk of going crossways with uh, our, our restrictions related to noticing um, commi actual commission meetings with quorums. So I see some commissioners have asked questions in the chat box. And if you could just perhaps put those in an email to Sam Gibney, and then she will send them to staff to respond to. That would be great. So with that, um, we're gonna open the floor. I know this particular presentation wasn't quite as riveting as the last one, but it does provide a context within which all of the wonderful ideas that were brought up need to uh, 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 reside in. So if there are questions or comments or thoughts, um, that is a lot of fairly technical information. Um, but we're here, we have a half an hour and we'll take the time to make sure you get your answers. And if we can't answer tonight, we will certainly um, bring back answers to the next public meeting and or post them on the website. I've seen several people ask questions around the stakeholder list. That list and a summary of the data will be published on the website. That list was derived primarily from commissioners asking for particular groups and individuals to be reached out to. So all of those entities were reached out to and um, were in the process of, of having those meetings and conversations. Okay, so we have one from Helen Wheatley. Is the hotel and the RV park the main project? What about hands-on children's museum lot, etc.? I would like to understand what the project encompasses. Would these be separate projects? So the project in front of us today is a planning effort. Uh, the RV park and the um, hotel are autonomous projects that will likely, um, if they move forward, and again, we will recall the process for moving a project forward with the commission. Um, the RV park has been approved by the commission, so that will be moving forward, um, but hands-on children's museum lot are all still, um, you know, the, the maps that, that Amos shared last time um, are, are still valid. So there are still areas that we're open to ideas on. What about the admin building? That was mentioned in the first. So I would encourage folks also to please, it's on our website. Um, if you go to portolympia.com and search destination waterfront, there is a whole page dedicated to this project where all of the documentation and the PowerPoints are posted. Uh, the admin building was discussed at the first public meeting. It is part of this project. It is part of the overall vision for the area. The commission has approved funding to move the project forward um, and we're contemplating locations and that's kind of the next step um, is where are all of these ideas going to reside? A quieter group than last time. Right. You're also welcome to unmute yourselves and speak as well. And if, oh, if, yeah. This is Bob Jacobs. Can you hear me? We can, Bob. Yeah. Uh, thank, thank you. I I just am um, I'm most interested in the path that runs through the entire area here. Um, this is a a, a very important. Uh, uh, it's in the city's plans, it's in the county trails plans, uh, it's part of the so-called Big W Trail uh, that would run around the whole waterfront. And uh, it's, uh, it's in very good shape for the most part, and uh, I'm hoping that uh, it will be 
looked at as a very important um, piece of support for whatever happens down there. This is uh, uh, the public loves to walk along the water. We know that. And, uh, and I just would like to see that brought up to whatever the current standards are uh, for uh, trails or paths uh, of this nature. Uh, also that, uh, that uh, there be sufficient setbacks from the trail to any buildings because the trail's value to the public is uh, very severely diminished if there are big structures looming over it. Uh, you can get an idea of that uh, by walking the trail at the boatworks and uh, as compared with say the Ford office, which is much shorter. Uh, and uh, I invite everybody to take that walk and get a feel of, of uh, how important it is that buildings be kept back away from the path uh, and uh, any high buildings be uh, stepped back in addition to being set back. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the comments, Bob. I will respond to them. The trail uh, was recently, as you perhaps know, dedicated to Billy Frank Jr. It is a very important community asset. As I went through the port strategic plan, community assets is a primary, our primary component of the Port Commission's vision for the organization. That is a very uh, important asset and at no point has uh, not having the trail been contemplated. Um, we appreciate it and are actually in the process of adding signage to it in collaboration with the Squaxin tribe um, and the Squally tribe to, to tell the story of Billy Frank Jr. Um, so that will definitely be uh, integrated into the overall schematic of, of this final document. As far as building heights, et cetera, um, I will defer back to what Amos discussed earlier about city of Olympia um, code and shoreline uh, height restrictions. So of course, uh, you know, at, at a base, we, the Port of Olympia will comply with, with all of the regulations that are in place. Um, many of which are to ensure that you don't have large walls up near, you know, six foot buildings that 45, 60, you know, you're not going to get that tall building next to the water based on existing code and the shoreline requirement. Right. And just to add to that, that the city also has some design requirements that um, all projects must meet as well. So on top of certain height limitations, there are other um, means and methods for the city to regulate what can and can't be built on, on particular sites. So we'll make definitely projects will have to comply to those, those specifications. I'm going to jump up to chat and go through one by one all of the comments. If and when I skip a commissioner, it is not for lack of respect. It's again to not go crossways with the Open Public Meetings Act. But I'm going to start at the top and make sure that all the questions get answered. So Noreen asked who or which organizations are included in the select stakeholder meetings. I don't have a list in front of me tonight of all of the organizations, but they will be added to the um, project website. Deb Patton, will you be posting the PowerPoint of the plan? Um, you mean of from the first meeting, Deb, or what, what plan are you wanting the PowerPoint for? Tonight, all PowerPoints will be posted including the first one that had the some of the maps. Uh, what I was, uh, yes, the PowerPoint from the last meeting, which I was on, it's a wonderful PowerPoint. I just think if people are gonna take that survey by 10 o'clock tonight, they should see that PowerPoint because it shows the site plans, it shows where the trails are, it shows the renderings of the buildings, it shows the setbacks, it shows the, um, sea level rise uh, mitigation, shows the corridors to downtown and all that. So I just don't know that the very many people, I mean, I've seen it and I, it's been on the website for quite a while, but I just don't know if everybody on this call or everybody in that call. Thank you. Yeah, no, that's a great, that's great feedback. And I do encourage everybody to go to portolympia.com and search for destination waterfront and the information from meetings past, present, and future, uh, and any documentation that is necessary will, will be posted there. Um, let's see, what is the required parking for marinas? I don't have that on the top of my head. I know our marina manager is on. 
and either he or Amos might know that. And if not, we can certainly get back with an answer. Let me see if I can go back to the parking list. I don't know if I had that in the, the rundown. I did not. So I can I can definitely look into that. Okay, so we will come back with an Wait, answer. Rachel, Rachel, yeah. this is Sam. I think I can um, provide an answer to that. Um, the uh, governing um, standard for that is going to come from the Army Corps of Engineers, which required parking for the marina in our original uh, permit for this. So I believe that's that's going to be the governing standard. Right. I think the question was how many spots were required, but we can certainly get back with the response specific number of spots. Um, Shanti, I answered the question about the select stakeholder list. Where would we access the market studies that show 33% for the RV park? Are these available on the port website? Um, Alan, I will look to you to respond to, to that. I don't believe they're on the port website at this point. Yeah, the port hasn't published uh, these market studies yet. It's still information that we're utilizing as, as we move forward in, in our recommendations and efforts. Okay. I responded to Helen Wheatley's both. Chuck Fowler, the Port of Bellingham has a hotel at its Squillisum Harbor development. Are there lessons to be learned from this project? Um, I am certain that there are. Um, if you have anything more to share, uh, your perspective on what brought that to, to the fore, that would be wonderful, Chuck. Chuck, are you on? If you are, no, you're I'm likely- trying to, I was trying to unmute. Uh, I just know that there is a hotel there. I believe it's called the Hotel Bellwether. And uh, I don't know anything about it, but it seems to me that that might provide some information for how a hotel might operate uh, on the Port Peninsula. That's great feedback. So um, duly noted, and uh, Alan and myself can take that back. Yep. Uh, Meg Van Schorl, some projects have already been approved by the commission. Some are newly arising from public process. For those that are brought forward during this process, when, how will they be considered by commission staff? Will they all be in the final report presented on February 8th or will there be a, vet a vetting narrowing before then? It's my anticipation that the, pro that the plan will show possibilities that exist for various development sites and won't be prescriptive. The process is the same for any capital investment. It will be brought forward to the commission, um, likely by way of a six-year capital plan. Uh, those projects that are determined uh, by the port commission through additional commission contemplation um, to move forward based on the ideas that are contained in the final report. Um, those need to be approved uh, in budgets, and that's essentially how they then are able to move forward. Um, so that's really the process. Um, like I say, it won't, the final plan I'm not anticipating will not be very prescriptive, but will provide options based on feedback that's been heard um, through the various avenues that we've used to, to receive feedback. Um, Ted, I have a question to the destination waterfront, similar to the one I just responded to. And again, some of that will rely on our capacity to bond and to uh, finance the project. So as the commission decides what projects they want to see move forward, there will need to be an accompanying strategy um, of finance to ensure that we're not approving projects that we can't afford to move forward on, but that we're staged in how they're, they're moved forward. Hi, this is this is actually Rachel, who is Ted. On I think it's my husband's name on the <laughs> on the thing. Um, I just want to make sure I'm clear about. So for the for the ideas that do not have a formal feasibility study, then are we talking about a six year window? Bef so it seems like those ideas will be not as fully formed as the the ones that have a yeah. lot of analysis. For sure, they won't be as fully formed, but they'll still be brought forward to the commission and the commission then can ultimately decide which, you know, the which 
uh, ideas that were brought forward are the ones that they would like to ultimately have the port invest in within the bounds that were discussed earlier. So whether it's fully vetted or not by February 8th, uh, I understand that a lot of good ideas won't be, um, but that doesn't diminish uh, their ability to be put in front of the commission for, for their consideration as part of that larger package. And then there will be, there will necessarily be a next step where the commission really works together to refine the vision that they have as the governing body. Great, thank you so much. You're so welcome. Um, so when can we expect to have the market studies posted? I don't have a, um, I don't have an answer for that, but we will by the next meeting. So please hold tight to that question. Is there a habitat mitigation fund being developed for the remediation of the shoreline? There isn't a commission approved fund currently. That being said, we are starting to contemplate funding sources, be that be they grants, et cetera, particularly for the um, southern part of the East Bay that is eroding, as we all know. So um, those conversations are early. So is there a fund in place, Jeffrey? There is not at this point. but that's a great question. Any other questions, thoughts? Robert, has the port taken into consideration the potential of noise and light complaints from hotel operators? How would the port protect 24 seven industrial use of the marine terminal from possible complaints? The marine terminal is a use that is not being contemplated for change in this process. So any um, use that is decided by the commission to move forward will necessarily have to take into account how, um, whether it's lease provisions or, you know, what, what the mechanism is, is to be determined, but, you know, how there can be compatibility um, and understanding that there is going to be noise and some light in an industrial site. And so um, definitely on the table as part of the conversation and not one that we are in any way avoiding, we recognize it's going to be central to lease agreements, et cetera, as we move forward to ensure that we don't end up in a situation where expectations are different from reality. Everyone is so quiet. You can unmute and speak to everything's coming through the, the chat tonight. Hi, it's Helen. Hi, Helen. Um, I was wanting to follow up on, I'm sorry, I forgot your name, but the earlier question, who's the person who's not Ted. <laughs> um, based on the, the, I'm looking at the development map from the earlier meeting, and I'm just wondering, um, after you look at the proposed hotel, um, RV park, et cetera, it seems like the only other potentially developable or redevelopable area is the ore area kind of next to the cascade pole site is that true because it looks like the parking lot by hearth fire i mean if there's potentially a hotel there and then there's hearth fire there's not that and can't really be able recorded. to pull up that map i was yeah. just about to offer that yeah yeah i mean just because it seems like there's a lot of interest i mean if if people are interested in doing something else it seems like you're talking about an alternate potential alternative to the hotel or let's pull only up the other space that way we can have a discussion because Amos did a great job of really articulating those yeah. ideas that are kind of ripe for ideas. I also want to say that some of these ideas can have co um, co you know you can collaborate. So yeah, an office uh, marina may be one uh, element, but who's to say that there isn't a retail component to that or uh, you know, some of the nonprofits get together, as was discussed during the first meeting, and, you know, have a Maritime Heritage Center as an element of the Marina Admin Office. I mean, so there are ways that there's kind of collaboration and working together um, so that, you know, if it says Marina Admin, it doesn't have to only be that. There, there can be room for, for creativity there. But if, because um, I'm thinking about you know, sorry, but I'm, I'm thinking about specifically the question of if people wanted a community sailing center or whatever, sort of where potentially that could go, because um, that would need some kind of access to the to the water. So I believe that Amos is getting that map. Oh, is that not sh uh, sharing on screen now? 
you share? Let me pull that up. All yes. right. Still quite a bit, Helen, as you can see. I mean, and also down at the bottom there by Hearthfire, those docks and you know, some of that area as well as being contemplated. Um, so there, there are some, you know, it isn't a large geography that we're looking at to begin with. Um, so with that being said, there is some room, and like I say, some room for creativity in particular. I just might add, Rachel, uh, I think part of the discussion that we've had before are a sailing center, a maritime museum, a marine science center, and, and uh, paddleboard, kayaks, and all of that. And I think those ideas really need to come together rather than individual ideas uh, coming about. So it seems to me there's a possibility for a marine center where all of these entities could be included. And that's the site which you just uh, alluded to. And that's known, I guess, as birth four of the marine terminal. That location where there are pilings now, that is the former location of Ward Shipbuilding and the Olympia Shipbuilding Company in World War I. They built uh, major uh, wooden ships there and so that does have water access and it's deep water location. That was also the location of, I believe it was Stabberts Marina and the Olympia Marina. That was a private uh, marina and they had slips and so forth. So I think that is a possible site to look at for what would, might be a combined integrated uh, marine center, which would serve all of the nonprofits and some of the, some of the uh, uh, purposes that that we've outlined here. And I'd love to hear that. I have a question. Could someone point on the map the spot that he just described? Because I'm not as familiar with it, and I'm scrolling back and forth. Right there. Okay, Down so that's Hearthfire. right next to Hearthfire. Well, there. It's, it's it's that lagoon which is to the right of Hearthfire. Hearthfire is there, and then there's that Great. lagoon. That's where the ships were launched and built during World War One, and that's where the marina was. I think in the uh, 50s and 60s. What a great history. That's great. Well, be before it went out of business. So, hello, this is Jeff Miller. Can you hear me? We can, yeah. Jeff. Okay, so what I have not heard in this whole presentation, and, and it is looking about funding and and those type of resources, that, that North Point, the, the heritage on that dock, very valuable. But has anybody really approached the idea of um, opportunity zone funds to, to help stimulate the investment on this peninsula? Because um, last I checked, this peninsula is an opportunity zone clear out on the water. At this point, we haven't. We would like a plan before we move forward with kind of the financing behind it and a plan that the commission is behind um, and then we will certainly be wanting to hear and explore all possibilities for financing. Okay, thank you. Yeah, no, it's a great suggestion. Thank you, Jeff. Rachel, this is Richard Wolf. Hi, Richard. Hi, um, at, at our advisory committee meeting, we talked to some extent about um, over the water possibilities and, and pros and cons. I, I think it might be helpful Maybe you could give a little bit of a brief on that, we, on that discussion. Yeah, so KG Wise is coming up and there are some opportunities um, there to reimagine if they choose you know, not to, and I'll lean a little on Alan who is uh, our lead for real estate, but we do have some opportunities, both uh, those highlighted in yellow existing. So those we could keep the same footprint without having to do additional mitigation. Um, as we discussed during the advisory meeting too, if there was more over water, it's not impossible. And it's also a challenge because you have to essentially uh, mitigate for impacts. Um, but we do have these two existing sites. So uh, Alan, are you able to speak a little more to the KGY site? Yeah, I, I think essentially what you said is accurate. Um, you know, the port has no desire to, to change the location of KGY. However, um, you know, their their leases are, are shorter term. And so we've been just keeping that in the mix 
uh, potentially if that site was to be vacated of what the use is and the value that it has for the overwater uh, footprint. So Rachel, this is Bob Butts. How are you? Good, how are you? It's nice to see you on the call. Yes, so I wanna go back to the overwater site where the old marina was and there's a portion of the marine terminal that isn't currently being used. It's right on the north end. Are there any specific plans for using that portion of the terminal in the years ahead? There are not any plans. Um, the terminal property is not within the scope of this project. So we're really looking at that land and property that is outside of the marine terminal. Um, hoping for, you know, really a plan that provides compatible uses um, and coexistence in a way that, you know, we get that industrial heritage as well that continues to live in downtown Olympia with the ideas that emerge from this process and from uh, the commission's existing decisions. So at this point, there isn't any um, plan to evacuate uh, and rezone any portion of that area that's already uh, in within the gate for the marine terminal. So I was excited when you said, let's be creative. I know. <laughs> and when I look at that overwater site where the marina was, there's really no upland um, other than the parking lot there. So just taking a sliver of land that's currently not being used by the terminal, um, would really make a big, big difference for the effective use of that overwater site. And I'm going to say that your comment is duly noted. Um, <laughs> and All right, you may hear yeah. that. So. <laughs> so I'm gonna hit some of the comments. We have four minutes left that have come in in chat. Uh, from Stacy Waterman Hoy. Hi, Stacy. Our Butis Folk School is in need of a long term home for wooden boat building, canoe, kayak building, and other craft, music, dance, cultural activities. We would be interested in meeting up with any potential partners. Chuck, I'm looking at you. Um, okay, so Stacy and Chuck, hopefully you can make some connections here. Um, can KGY be relocated into any other properties in this area? That would really be up to KGY um, and their negotiations with Alan related to their lease, um, either extending their lease or moving. Um, where they move is ultimately up to them and the entity that they choose to lease from if it is no longer the port. Um, if this has been discussed in previous meetings, I apologize, this is Corey Oldman, but what is the plan for additional traffic? That would obviously need to be taken into account during the permitting phase um, of any and all of these projects. So um, there would be SEPA reviews on all of new construction on these sites and traffic would most certainly be uh, an element of that. Um, will this have some kind of cumulative impact EIS? Um, it is under the old comp or is it under the old comprehensive scheme? It is under, it all falls within the existing comprehensive scheme, Helen. So environmental review on a plan level isn't necessary. Additionally, this isn't a plan per se. This is a development plan, a development strategy. So it's a bit different than a land use plan that would need to undergo uh, environmental review. That being said, as I mentioned earlier, all projects will need to undergo project level SEPA when they hit the permitting desk at City of Olympia. And all of those considerations will be taken into account. Yeah, I just want to mention, this is Dave Bonato from Supporters of Olympia Community Sales. Hi, Dave. I think the opportunity to combine efforts, especially with nonprofits, is an interesting one. I just want to raise some ideas, some thoughts about some of the funding. So there may be opportunities for specific funding towards things like a community sailing center that may not be available to sort of other nonprofits. And the idea of collaborating is great, but we should think strategically about optimizing the funds that might be available to different pieces of, of those types of uh, activities or potential opportunities uh, that might exist. So we need to think that through if it goes forward. <laughs> and as, as Alan described earlier, you know, that some of that will be work that you do amongst within the community amongst one another 
um, because again, the mechanisms that the port has to engage are selling land, land leases, you know, that we have some wiggle room to be more creative than that too, but those are really the primary mechanisms um, that we have to move forward. So how that um, moves forward and is aligned with the commission approved financial measures. So, you know, we have lots of policy that the commission sets for the port that we have to demonstrate every new project meets to ensure that, you know, we're living up at, on a staff level to the direction that we've been given by those in charge at the organization. So, you know, there are some hurdles that need to be with any project um, overcome but to really stay grounded in what are the mechanisms that ports have to, to engage, you know, and, and let's, that, that's where we get to be creative is within the bounds of the law and authority and policy that's set at various levels from the state down to the commission. Um, looks like people are connecting online. That's fabulous. I see people sharing info. Um, Rachel will contact you tomorrow. Okay, to have a nonprofit planning. Great. I can't do the planning, but I can certainly be a voice to uh, our bounds and essentially how do we uh, make some of these ideas reality within the bounds of what the port is authorized to do. So I'm, I'm available for that. Um, it is 631. Again, um, I could keep going all night. I imagine others have things to do. Um, I'll leave maybe one more, one more question. If we have one more question that folks, why is Envir, um, it's not being deferred. So I have a question from Robert. Why is the environmental impact review under SEPA being deferred? It isn't being deferred. SEPA is very clear on when environmental review needs to occur and it will be done when the law requires that it be done. Um, SEPA isn't something you can generally do just to do. Um, you need to have a plan that contemplates kind of changes to what is contained in the comprehensive scheme. That would undergo SEPA, but this is not part of the comprehensive scheme. This is a development plan, not a land use. And or when a project hits a permitting desk, uh, it will need to undergo SEPA by the lead authority, who, whoever has lead authority. So I hope that answers your question, Robert. In no way, shape, or form would the port ever defer um, environmental review. My understanding is that the environmental impact process is required when an action is taken by government. And I don't quite understand why there would not be an environmental impact review under this project as soon as the plan is approved. Yeah, so the plan won't be adopted. The plan will be accepted. So because it will be accepted and not adopted, I mean, it gets into kind of a wonky zone. Um, it isn't a, an official land use plan. So let's say, you know, tomorrow morning, Alan got a call from Boat Building 101 that said, you know what, we can pay market rent for a land lease. It, it hits all your financial measures. We're not, we can contemplate something that isn't necessarily in this plan. So it isn't part of our comprehensive scheme. And the action that the commission will be taking is one of acceptance, not one of adoption. What, what is the difference between acceptance and adoption? Yeah, it's a nuanced one. It's the same that was done with our vision 2050. So it gives some flexibility. Acceptance says you, we accept this product, um, but we still reserve the right to make other choices. Um, it's not locked in like it would be if it was incorporated into the comprehensive scheme. Helen said it would be helpful to post the comprehensive scheme. Um, we can certainly post links to it. It is already on our website. If you go to portolympia.com, and do a search for comprehensive scheme of harbor improvements, um, it will be there. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for the good question. Environmental review is important. So Rachel, with, there was a, yeah. Oh, there's a question up above from uh, Bob about projects that have already been approved by the commissioners. Okay, and then this will be our last question. So what projects have already been approved by the port commission? Don't apologize. Um, a quick, uh, you can always go to um, portolympia.com and look through budget documents because we all love to spend our time looking through budget documents, right? So the projects that have already been approved to move forward by the commission are the RV park and the Marina admin office. Thank you. 
Mm -hmm. So I want to just say again, thank you to everybody who invested your precious time into providing us kind of walking down this path with us toward what will ultimately be this uh, development plan for the area being contemplated. Um, I am always available online. There is an info. Jenny, can you remind us of the email? If people have questions or comments, they can email and it will come to me. I, sometimes when you're in a meeting, it's hard to think of the questions you wanna ask. But if some questions come to you in the middle of the night, Jenny, what is the email that, that will get folks? Inquiries, inquiries at portolympia.com. And we will be posting as we have um, details on our next public meeting. Um, and I encourage you to go to the website and peruse information if you're newer to the process. I'm burning. What? What, Jenny? Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Um, the joy of Zoom meetings. Um, so I just want to thank everybody for being here tonight and encourage you to stay engaged with this process. Um, and hopefully we can land at the finish line with a vision that really takes into account a lot of the feedback and understanding um, that is growing through the process. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Rachel and Enns. Great job. Thank you. Thanks, Rachel. Thank you all for being here. I appreciate it.